Hey Adventure Girls, I'm freaking stoked to introduce this amazing lady on our Why She Adventures speaker series for today. I'm Senka Radnitz, your creator of Adventure Girls and your host for Why She Adventures, a interview series that's all about everyday women who are getting out doing adventures and how they fit that into their everyday lives. So today I want to introduce an amazing lady. She has done ultra marathons through the jungle, through uh, deserts. She has done the coast to coast heaps of times. <laughs> and, and she recently just did a massive expedition over to Iceland. So I want to introduce to you someone who I have just been waiting to interview, Holly Woodhouse. All right, so welcome along, Holly, to our Whitey Adventure Speaker Series. I was just saying uh, for all of you guys that are watching this uh, interview, I was just chatting to Holly before we hit the record, as you do, we always have a little catch up, and I was like, oh my God, I was so stoked that she said yes to this. And then when I saw her bio and I read everything she's done, I was like, holy shit, this woman's amazing. Like, if somebody doesn't walk away inspired by hearing her story, I'm like, you just... Don't know what you're doing. <laughs> so, Holly, <laughs> thanks so much for coming along and saying yes to this. Oh, no problem. Stoked to be here. Thank you for inviting me on the show. Whoop, whoop. Awesome. So, uh, like I said, I read your bio and I was just like, holy shit, like, look at all the cool stuff you've done. But I also noticed that that didn't kick into like kind of almost, I would deem recent. You know, know what I mean? Yeah. So that's really exciting because it gives all these women out here some hope that if it's been sitting in the back of your mind, oh, I want to go and do some cool stuff, it doesn't matter that you didn't get into it when you were like 12. Yeah, <laughs> Even no. us women can get into it. So let it, like, when did you start getting into all this stuff? What was that sort of pivotal moment that you went, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this? I, I can pinpoint the exact moment I went. I was fortunate to go on an Outward Bound course and uh we had to do a a solo trip we went up into the to the hills at outward bound uh and we were dropped off sort of two days two nights by ourselves and we had to write ourselves a letter and I, it was in that letter that i wrote down a goal that following coming back from outward bound i would do one adventure each year that challenged me and i mean i just i wrote it down and I had no idea, but it was just enough for me to come back from Outward Bound and sign up for the Coast to Coast. And it was just like, it was just that one thing to force me to go back to do that one goal. And then it's just snowballed from there, really. How on earth did you go and go, hey, I'm just going to go smash up the coast to coast because that girl <laughs> is no mean feat so like anyway for anyone who doesn't know what coast to coast maybe for them and what that is so that they yeah. can get an idea of like you know that it's not just a 10k run in the park <laughs> you know it's literally uh coast to coast is a new zealand's biggest multi-sport race uh it's 33 or 34 years old so I grew up watching it it goes from Kamara Beach on the west coast and you do road biking and then you do a mountain run through Goats Pass which is epic and then a small little connector bike and then you kayak the Waimakere River and then you do the final bike back into Christchurch so in total it's 230 ish kilometers uh, and you can do it in one day or two days so the one day is like the hardcore uh, it's kind of you'd like your tick of uh, tick of approval in the multi-sport world I reckon but um, you can do it as a team as well it's just such a fantastic event and yeah I signed up I signed up to do the two day so you do sort of half on the first day and half on the second day and gave myself a year to train for that and just got immersed in this amazing multi-sport world and met some really cool people and explored this this incredible landscape like right literally right on my doorstep and yeah that was sort of like the start of it but I mean I've always been into sport but it probably wasn't yeah until I went on that outward bound that I really decided that I needed a bit more of that in my life. What do you think like when you went away on that because I'm or even like 
for some people, even just doing two days, two nights solo at camping, being dropped <laughs> off is already like you can, their heart races. It's probably yeah, going, yeah. what the fuck? <laughs> so, so like, like when did you like what got you to going to that even to do that to go say yes to doing that? That obviously was a tipping point for the rest of the glorious adventures you've been up to. Well, I was uh, 27, living in Ashburton, Ashburton's home. Um, I'd gone overseas and I'd come back and doing a job, which I really I loved, but I just kind of thought this is not where 18-year-old Holly thought 27-year-old Holly would be. <laughs> and so I... I knew there was something just not kind of missing, really. And this opportunity came up for an outward. I applied for an outward bound scholarship and I got it. And six months later, I went on this outward bound course. And it was just what I was looking for. It was the total turning point or just a platform for me to, to change what I was doing. And, to, yeah, and it was through adventure that I really found that, that extra thing that was not that it was missing, but I've always loved sport. I've always loved the outdoors. And it was just something to make me realize that I actually need more, th more of that in my life, really. And competing in events like Coast to Coast was something that I dreamed of and I'd watched. And it's something I'd always wanted to do. But it's like, you know, I don't know. You know, will I do it now? Will I do it later? And it was just enough for me to be like, right, now's the time to go and do it. Need a challenge. Yeah. It's funny. I think uh, I think when we're so busy with life and stuff like that, we can often turn down those niggles, those callings yeah. that like our little souls going, hey, girl, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> go on an adventure. Yes. <laughs> no, 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 uh, I'm too busy doing stuff. Like I got too life. Busy. Yeah, exactly. Too busy doing life. And yeah. then it's like, you just need to, yeah, write down a goal. That was it for me. Yeah. yeah. Because yeah. I, rem I remember, like, for me, for mountain biking was the thing that tipped me into this whole world of adventure where I was like, what the hell have I been missing out my entire life? Yeah. <laughs> I'd gotten into party I got into partying when I was in my early 20s. And then I had a really bad, I've spoken about it heaps of time, I had a really bad <laughs> night out where I was like, I legit thought I was going to have to go to the hospital and get my stomach pumped. It was just one of those really crazy oh, nights. Yeah. yeah. And then, like, would have been, like, not even, like, a couple of weeks later, a friend said, oh, you should come to this place called Woodhill. You can go mountain biking. And I was like, okay, let's give it a go. Yeah. yeah. And I pushed my bike around for probably three of the – two of the three hours that we were out. But I came back with a smile that was so yeah. big from ear to ear. And I was just like, man, I go out taking drugs to get this high. And I feel like shit afterwards. And then you can go mountain biking and that buzz just doesn't wear off. And it was it's, like my whole yeah. world changed after that. I was like, bought a mountain bike within a month. I was just, that was it. I was like, uh, this is my just, drug. Yeah. Yeah. This is that. This is my <laughs> new addiction and all the, for all the right reasons. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's what cool. Would, yeah. What would you say to women that are um, like, like that niggly part? Like, what would you say to women out there if they're hearing that for themselves? They're like watching our video, they're hearing our conversation. They're like, yeah, yeah. I kind of, I have a little of that going on right now. I, I, uh, if you don't do it now, I just, you know, what's, what's, there's no point in putting it off and there's no harm and you might not even actually do what you set out to do, but I guarantee you that journey along the way will, will be just as much of a reward as actually probably that goal that you set out to do. So you just, you never know what's around the corner. And so just go for it. Just do something. You, know, you think it's like totally crazy. For me, that coast to coast is by, was by far the biggest thing that probably adventure wise I will ever do because I was so terrified. I'd never done anything like it. Um, but I look back now and I just, I look at my, my adventures since then. And I, you know, I had no idea what was in store for me, but without doing coast. I don't actually know, you know, you just don't know what's around the corner. And so just go for it. I love that so much. I love that. Just how you say, like, whatever you set that goal to be, whether you complete that one or you, 
you start that whole journey is where you really discover so much of like the edges of all of your comfort zone and all these parts of you that you're like, Oh, I didn't know I was afraid of that. Or I yeah. didn't know I could freaking do that. How, or like, even how like, is that for you? Yeah. You, or, or you're just like, I didn't even know that place was half an hour down the road and I've been living in this spot for, you know, it's all the little things that you don't even think about. So why the goal might be, something tangible that you can see or you know see or do it's all the little things that come out of it the people you meet the places you go uh and also you know a lot of us are working as well it's that creating a bit of outside work-life balance to keep to keep the mental game strong <laughs> <laughs> and that's something that I love it I'd love to talk a little bit about that as soon as you've opened that topic up I'm like anyone who's watching any of this series knows that I say, I so I say to everyone, we've got, I've got a bunch of questions. We're just going to talk about whatever comes <laughs> up because I think what happens is people see, like hear your story, see what you do. And then they must make a bit of an assumption. Oh, she must be like a full-time adventurer. So she's not doing anything <laughs> else. But the truth is you still work full-time and you do this. So I'm kind of like, you know, all you ladies that have got those excuses of, <laughs> you know, I'm like, Hey, so how do you how do you strike a bit of balance between like going getting up going to work every day every yeah. day and then training for something like the coast to coast let's say for the first time because there would have been a whole lot of learning curves that would yeah. come from that I'm sure yeah definitely where I where I'm working now they are amazing I work for the New Zealand Merino company and I also think the reason why it works so well is because I love my job. I love, I'm a graphic designer, so I work in the creative team and it really, that just feels like a really big part of my itch. I, I love designing and all that. On the flip side of that, I, um, I love getting outside, which I sit at a computer for eight hours a day. <laughs> um, and so there's a real, there's this real need for me to mm. step away from the computer and I, you know, I, I'm actually probably very good at leaving work at work. I am lucky that I don't really, outside of my work hours, I don't really think about work, even though I love it. And there's always a little bit said there. Um, but I'm very good at finishing work and going and going for a run or going for a bike or definitely my weekends. I always plan my weekends so that I... I have a good balance between my work and my play. So I don't come back to sort of work and think, ah, oh, all I'm doing is working or, um, I mean, I like work. I love work. So my weekends are my weekends and my work is my work. So I think, and plus, uh, like it keeps mentally, it keeps, keeps everything ticking over if you can have a, a good balance there. Yeah, yeah I agree. I totally agree. Because it sounds like, and I think that's probably one thing that we can probably practice a little bit more in our lives is being really like present and the things that we're currently doing. So like you say, yes. you know, go to work, be present in it, love it, do it, you know, fully all in, immersed in it, and then take that hat off and then go, you know, close the door and go, okay, I'm going to go have an adventure. So why would you want to leave the tabs open for work when <laughs> all you want to do is soak up all of that? So you know, like being in the practice of being really present in those and whatever things we're currently doing. And it just, I don't know about you, but for me, I find that it really makes the experience so much more full because it's the one your head is just in that space right there. Yeah. I, I do want to, on that topic though, I, I work for a company and I, I have worked for myself before and that's probably why I work for a company now because I found when I'm working for myself, it all just became one and it was a very good lesson in mental mental health probably is separating uh, work and play or life outside of work to keep to keep the mental game strong really <laughs> working up working for yourself is extremely rewarding but also extremely consuming if it, if you let it sort of take over everything of your life yeah it's really good to get some distinct to get distinctions on that for yourself though so because yeah. I mean at the end of the day and this is the whole thing is at the end of the day 
we're here for one shot, you know, we never know when our time is up. Yeah. So why don't we want to live a life that's full of like doing the things that we love with the people that we love. And part of that is our own mental health and wellness around all of that. So what a great distinction to get that, that it's like where you're at. It's like in order for you to have that really good on off kind of lifestyle that it's like, you love it and the fact that you're working for a company that you love as well so yeah absolutely yeah 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 no definitely oh my god that's amazing okay so how was it getting on the start line for your first coast to coast then like for all the prep training and all of that like what was how was that it was amazing and I I trained extremely hard for that first coast to coast and I put for a year I put my all into that and I stood on that line and I was that start line so nervous but also uh, I knew I'd done it I knew I'd put the work in Um, and so I knew I'd put the work in and so no matter what the outcome I was happy with where I am you know sometimes you can turn up to the start line you're like I wish I'd done more training but I like always actually since probably but um, that first coast to coast I think it's because because it was the first one, it was so big. It was this really iconic race. I put in a whole year of training. Uh, and I just, yeah, it turned up to the start line and I just knew I was ready. Plus also a year is a long time to train for one particular event. Uh, <laughs> and so I was just, yeah, ready to give it a crack. Yeah. And so going through the actual race itself what were what did you find some of the biggest challenges were that i guess if we're asking if there's a big challenge there's got to be a big bit of growth that comes from it so like what was some of the stuff that came up for you where you were just like what the fuck and then you're like oh okay got the learning thank you and without sounding too uh i don't know what the right word is but that, the whole race just went so well for me and uh, I think my biggest word learning mm. on the flip side was prepare for something properly mm. and and you will have an amazing time like so I'd put in I knew I'd put in the the effort and uh I just I was I went through each stage and I was just like buzzing when I got to my support crew because I'd just done so much better than I'd ever imagined that I would uh, and I remember that first bike, and it was the fastest I've ever biked in my life. I got caught in this, bun- <laughs> this bunch of these guys and sat at the very back and just got towed along. I can remember looking down at my computer and the, the speedometer on my computer, and I was just like, holy shit, we are going so fast. <laughs> and I just managed to hang on to the back of that group, and yeah, that first bike set me up for the entire race, and I think mentally as well, you know, you, you start something in a good space. And you can, and then yeah, jumped on the run and loved the run and got on the kayak and <laughs> fell out, but managed to to get get myself down and last bike in. And I was struggling by the by the time I got to Sumner Beach, but uh, it was a pretty awesome day. Yeah. Oh my god, that's amazing! You make it like sound like I should do a coast to coast. Like, oh, it's, uh, sounds awesome. But I, like I, and I mean. I it's always that thing like something that I mean I thought it was impossible when I looked at these people that had raced had raced before as sort of these iconic legends that were sort of doing something almost um non-human but you know you break it down and then you do it and you realize that they're just ordinary people out there as well and everyone is just having a great time and seeing themselves a challenge to do something outside their comfort zone yeah oh my god that sounds amazing I, I love the fact you say you were so prepared and that's what actually made the whole adventure yeah worth it all so that you came out the other end going that was fucking rad <laughs> <laughs> I was just like what just happened that was the coolest thing ever I have got the bug yeah <laughs> did you coast to coast even like <laughs> I just went from one side of New Zealand to the other under human power. <laughs> Dude, that's yeah. freaking amazing. Like full kudos to you. Cause like now that I'm down in Christchurch, you, I can feel it's- getting pulled <laughs> into like adventure racing in a bigger scale than I've yeah. done before. Like I've just recently 
when I moved down here, the first thing I got into was row gaining, and now it's just oh, like so much fun. Oh, how do you not not row gain? <laughs> this is like it's like you're running around getting exercise, but you're using your brain, and then it's like then if you're in a team, you've got to have teamwork going on, and that's just the dynamics are phenomenal. So I love like fully hooked on row gaining now. So just been like doing a few of those treasure hunt. So much it fun. is, <laughs> except <laughs> except when you get lost. <laughs> I was telling a story. We just did a, the Little River row game. Oh, this, yeah, cool. Yeah, we did the six-hour one. But it took us, so an hour in, we couldn't find the first one. Oh. A whole hour, and it was just like, it was like <laughs> mega muddy. We, were, we made a good decision to switch from trail running shoes to boots and because the ah. mud was like ankle deep mud. Oh. So, um, but we just, we just couldn't get our head around the scale and we, for some reason yeah. we just really struggled with it and we were an hour in and like we we're just like what are we fucking doing <laughs> and we just had to really regroup because it was only two yeah. of us and it's still not my strength so uh, I, we really had to regroup and go okay let's just take a break take five and let's just go and look for the second one and we'll just see if things unfold and sure enough we stumbled across the first one we hadn't gone yeah. far enough and yeah, yeah. so it's so funny just like yeah <laughs> all that stuff that comes out of it but just just all that navigation component when you've got all those extra bits in there yeah so yeah yeah so from the coast to coast so <laughs> all of a sudden crack this whole like yeah. new world to, uh, opens up for you what did you set as your next goal what was the next like Okay, well, if I can coast to coast, I can. <laughs> but she went to the Sahara and did the Marathon de Saab through the Sahara Desert in Morocco. Yeah. Okay, so uh, kilometres, amount of kilometres? 260. Oh, yeah, just a cash yeah. 260. <laughs> yeah, we were so naive. That was, to, yeah. Uh, it was something I'd heard about that race before, but I'd, I was actually straight after coast to coast. I moved to London and did a year in London. And it was sort of now that I was over that side of the world, the the possibility of competing in something like that was seemed a lot more accessible. And so uh, it was actually my brother-in-law who lives in Kenya. Uh, he suggested that we go and do it. And we, he was setting up a charity called Four Rangers. Uh, so what we do were they raising. Do? So for Rangers is an awesome charity uh, based in Kenya, and so we raise money and uh, awareness uh, for Rangers welfare in Kenya. So the Rangers look after wildlife, um, specifically rhino, and the protection of rhino. Uh, and so Sam was living on a conservancy um, and helping. So he was sort of were tasked to sort of set up all these ranges and they just transported 21 black rhino onto Barana. And so he found that there wow. was quite a lot of uh, support out there for the rhino, but not specifically for the ranges. So the money that we continue to raise goes directly towards just basic living for them. So socks, boots, uniform, thermal imaging, uh, support for their families and and everything like that. So, so that was our first um, big. So the idea for Rangers is that one year, each year, um, a group of people would get together and do one big human-powered event to raise money uh, for this for this charity. So, yeah. So first one up was uh, Marathon de Sable in, in the Sahara. <laughs> Five of us <laughs> over there and two Kiwis to Brits and a Kenyan and yeah, race this race. Wow. So how different was doing that compared to doing <clears throat> the coast to coast? Because multidiscipline versus yeah. I'm assuming one. it's just one run you're running? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh so yeah, just running carried everything. So it was six days. We had a rest day in there, five days of running with a rest day. Uh, and we carried everything on our backs. So, wow. So is yeah, that all our food self-supported, is it? Is so right? fully self-supported, apart from um, they had these, like, tents, which was just like a carpet with four, held up by four sticks, uh, which we slept in at night. We slept under at night. And, yeah, so we'd carry everything else, and they gave us water at checkpoints along the way. Yeah, so... 
that was um, completely different from coast to coast and very different experience. And you were talking earlier about how you, you learn as you go. I found Sahara extremely tough. Uh, the heat, <laughs> the starters, super hot, super long. I had no idea about caring for my feet. So we got lots of blisters. Um, just, just the whole thing of you learn so much when you do things. And that was sort of the first biggest, I mean, it was over in the Sahara. It was all just so different from everything that I was used to really. Um, how do you, how do you push through on stuff like that? Like, you know, if you're running around here in Auckland or Christchurch, yeah. it's like, oh, I've got a blister. I'll just go home. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. You're like, oh, I'm on day one of five. Yeah, and I've okay. got. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what uh, do you do? Like, how do you manage that stuff? Because there's got to be a mental component as well as like a, you know, uh, cl- yeah. you know, clean them and like a practical component as well. So. Yeah, so I think Marathon de Sable taught me that r- adventure racing or any type of thing like that is you know, pretty much all mental. So it is, it's just a mental game. If you can keep your mental mind strong, then you'll get through it. Um, and like I suffered a lot in that race, <laughs> a lot, but I got through it because you had to and it just shows that, you know, you will you will get through stuff if, if you keep pushing and you keep going. That is amazing. I'm like, you're like, I suffered a lot and then you've still got this big smile on your face. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah, I can still feel the suffer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The suffer <laughs> yeah there was one of our day. The long day was ninety, ninety-three kilometers, and it was about three a.m. when we were in the sand dune, like sand dune after sand dune after sand dune, and we were all pretty low on self-esteem. And um, but we just pushed on through. And yeah, that was probably the the toughest point of a tough race. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what was that like then do you feel that was that any richer like experience wise self-satisfaction you know like crossing that finish line compared to say the coast to coast because you suffered more or there was yeah. just more challenge I don't want to say Very... suffering. people misunderstand the word yeah <laughs> uh very different sense both of them are very different um, like I've across the finish line and coast to coast with so much joy and so much excitement where I probably crossed the finish line in Morocco of just like, Oh, thank God that's over. <laughs> and I did it and I can take that one off and I don't have to go back. <laughs> so is it going back uh, on the must do again? Liz? <laughs> don't think I'll head back there. No. Um, <laughs> But I probably learned a lot more about myself in the Mar- in the Sahara than I did in the coast to coast. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. And then, of course, by contrast, in 2016, you went and <laughs> did a slightly smaller amount of 230 kilometers. <laughs> yeah. But you went through a jungle instead. So what, tell us yeah. about that. What was that, what was that race called? That's the... So that was, it was through Beyond the Ultimate. So they do four different races. And uh, so that was called the Jungle Ultra. So we were in the Amazon jungle in Peru. So we started, we drove from Cusco to the start. And then we headed down through the Manu National Park. Uh, and that was, I lo- it was awesome. It was so cool. It was like New Zealand's West Coast, but everything was massive, <laughs> like <laughs> massive animal, massive butterflies, like forest was just incredible. Yeah. It was a really, really cool race. Yeah. It's so interesting just hearing the different, how you talk about them so differently. Coast yeah. to coast, the, um, the, uh, marathon, the Sahara, the yeah. the Sahara <laughs> and then the, the jungle one, it's like, you know, there's definitely like a, oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what you will do again, what you won't do again. <laughs> yeah. It's good and, to know though. It's good to know. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Because I mean, at the end of the day, you want to do things that challenge you, but if you, you know, there's a space that you love again, why would you not do more of that? Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I think, yeah, for sure. And, Tell us a little bit about the um, Jungle Ultra then. Did that, was that self-supported? Were you racing solo, part of a team? 
so that was uh, solo and self-supported again. And we did it again while it was solo. There were 10 of us actually um, doing it for the Four Rangers charity. And it was completely different. Like there were over, I think there were over 2,000 or something ridiculous that did Marathon de Saab. And then there were 50 places for the Jungle Ultra. So it was, I think, like it was so, we got to know everyone on wow. it. And it was more like a little team or like a little community that's sort of running, running along. And um, yeah, there were 51 that did the jungle and there were 10 of us that were doing four ranges under the four ranges raising money. And there are only 21 of, of the 51 that finished the race and all 10 of us. We were last, however, uh, there were 21 of us that finished and it was, um, that was a total, that was awesome doing it, doing it with a crew. And you know, there was another a very good friend of mine, Jack. So I did a lot of my um, adventure racing and everything with really. And then all the rest were Brits and Kenyans. Uh, so it was really cool. Just a little community of us doing something so foreign in a completely strange, strange environment, uh, but all doing this massive adventure together. Yeah, so. Jungle was epic. I can't recommend that race enough. <laughs> <laughs> no, sir. <laughs> do, you think that, um, do you think that being not a, as a team, racing as a team, but do you think having that camaraderie and, yeah. you know, the bunch of other people that you like, that know each other that you like, that that helps pull you forward and make the yeah. whole race more fun? Everyone was so caring and because you – because it was smaller, you feel there's, you know, you create connections with people and out, out running, you know, and then yeah, everything, even down to like the medics and you, you knew everyone and they knew sort of, they knew what you were like the day before. And so there was a real personal aspect uh, to it compared to, I think the Marathon de Sale was just so vast that you're, you're almost a number if mm. without, without, without it being like that, but it was, a complete contrast to what we'd done in the Sahara and then to go to the jungle, just a totally different experience. And I must admit, I do like the smaller, more intimate where you get to know people and it's, it's like a bit of a family. It's just the whole experience makes it a lot better. That is amazing. And then of course, uh, so you go from jungle to last year, 2018, <laughs> like talk about, like, it's like, it's like, like, it's not until I started piecing it together. I'm like, not only have you just done epic extreme places, but we're talking complete contrast and terrain and temperature because last yeah. year you did the 29 days, no, 20, oh 29, 29 hard fought days across Greenland. <laughs> Yeah, like uh, snow. <laughs> not just snow. Yeah. Like, White. what did the temperatures get down to there? Like, that must have been we crazy. We recorded negative, yeah, negative 40. And it was freezing. It was so cold. That was when we were, <laughs> that was when we actually recorded it. So we were out walking. Um, but we were behind time and we had to make up kilometres. So we decided to start walking at 6 a.m. one morning we'd probably normally start walking about eight um but there was this blizzard that wasn't forecast but it was there so we just decided to start walking but we stopped after an hour and a half it was just what I my goggles on the inside were frozen and I could hardly see and well, there was this little gap down in one corner that I was sort of looking out and I could just watch the sled in front of me and I was just like do not lose that sled and then yeah, we just, an hour and a half, we were just frozen. So we stopped and put the tent up and regrouped and had some hot noodles and before we carried on again. <laughs> so that was Nordic skiing and you were, again, self-supported. So instead of putting stuff on your back, how, like, what did you guys do for that? Like for anyone who hasn't heard about this adventure or anything like that. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Because I've seen yes. photos <clears throat> and the photos of your training because I want to want to talk about that as well because it just... <laughs> There's a great photo of you with your training. And I was like, oh, we have to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the expedition uh, was through the Antarctic Heritage Trust. So they do this awesome initiative called Inspiring Explorers, where they are wanting to uh, inspire the next generation through 
through the polar regions. So uh, we, this was its third year. We retraced a guy called Fridjof Nansen, who'd walked, who was the first person to walk across Greenland 130 years earlier. And so I was extremely lucky to be selected. There were four of us that were selected. We had a guy from Antarctic Heritage Trust, Nigel, and then we had a um, guide, Bent, who was from Norway. And so we were told the trip would take us between 22 and 25 days and we took enough food for 27 and we did it in 29 just uh, due to extreme weather uh, and yeah but we so we had all our gear uh, we had these sleds we were on the skis um, with skins and we started on the west side and ended up on the east side and yeah so my sled was about 60 kgs and I was 55 when I left New Zealand and 47 when I finished so it what? was it was extreme I just even now I just can't even comprehend that I I did that that I managed to get across yeah it was a pretty extreme expedition <laughs> so compare that then to all the other ones that you've done like you know Two, you've packed two days less food than you need. <laughs> You're losing weight as you go, and you know the weather is so extreme. And yeah, like what's like how was that entire trip for you? Like, because that must have been it must have been challenging. So challenging. I, I mean, even three hours in, I was struggling. I was struggling to pull my my polka or the sled um, because I I wasn't I wasn't. I wasn't physically heavy enough to be able to, and Greenland's not flat. Uh, <laughs> alert, hello, someone should have told me that. <laughs> but uh, I'm getting onto the ice cap. Uh, you have to get onto the, you go to the ice shelf to get onto the ice cap, and it was a lot of like rolling frozen ice, and I just, I wasn't strong enough to pull my polka and ski on skins and I was just sliding everywhere to be able to actually move forward and uh, it was I just meant the mental battle I had in the first I, uh, two weeks I was just mentally pretty much just telling myself constantly just keep going just one more step just keep going and Yes, you have. I'd had little snippets of that in my races before where it might last an hour, but it never lasted like an entire day. You didn't get to end of the two weeks and you still had another two weeks of that. And I just, it's like, how am I, how do I, there's type one fun, there's type two fun, and then there's type three fun. And I think this was about type 10 fun. <laughs> We do like to have a lot of type two fun in our lives, don't we? <laughs> type 10. Uh, yeah, I just, I just, I mean, I, I have no idea how I was going to get through it uh, mentally, physically. It was what it was, but it's, it's a mental game. Uh, and so I just had to give myself many a talking to and just keep going. Just keep going, Holly, is pretty much what I, my mantra. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a uh, little song you could sing from Nemo. <laughs> it was, it's wow. still even thinking about it, like, gives me sweaty palms. Um, like, because I've, I've never, and I wonder if I ever will be pushed mentally and physically like that again in my life. How yeah. does that, how does that reshape the way that you, because you, in my mind, like I know whenever we go and do go away for a trip, like regardless of the extreme version, like going and doing ultras and all of that, like anytime we tend to travel away and we experience something either new or that's challenging, can't help but kind of get a bit of a rejiggle in how you see the world, you know, like sometimes it's just the environment. You go to a third world country and you come back and you're like, mm. wow, we're pretty freaking lucky, lucky to live here in New Zealand. But then to go through like those mental stretches as well, like, when you come back into normal life, yeah, uh, what's the re like? How's that readjustment of like? Okay, like so I was daily getting up and having to tell myself, "You can do this. You can do this. You can do this." 
to getting up and going, okay, well, I'm just going to go make a cup of tea and uh, <laughs> yeah. from my cup that I just boil. Yeah. <laughs> you can do this, Holly. <laughs> oh, I, I like it. it changed me hugely. It changed me so much more than I, than I ever thought it would. Uh, I came back with a huge appreciation for life just for the little things like that, being able to make a coffee, having my family, living in Christchurch, having this on your back doorstep, the ease of everything. And I, it always sort of, it's like, after Coast, I was like, well, what's next? After Marathon Desire, what's next? There's always something you come back and like, oh, what's next? I became back from Greenland and I was just like, I'm just staying put. <laughs> this is me. <laughs> I am just really okay with my day trips and my bed and my wine and you know just it was uh um but I I I know I'm extremely lucky because a lot of people go searching for their limit and some people probably never find what their limit is but I am no doubt I found my adventure limit in Greenland for sure and probably because of that I have I just I feel like I have nothing left to prove to myself in that space and so when I head out on these things I'm a lot more I like to think I'm just a lot more relaxed and a lot more appreciative about everything that's going on yeah, yeah it's funny like a rubber band right like once you start stretching it it'll never go back so it's yeah like, you know when you're stretching yourself that far, it's like all of a sudden perspective wise, yes. like what you thought was really yeah. hard or tricky. And, you know, you've just, you've stretched all those mental muscles and you're yeah. to go, oh no, that's actually, I've got that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But I'm aware that the opportunity, I was extremely lucky to have that opportunity and all the lessons that came out of Greenland. I just, yeah completely life-changing yeah, yeah wow that's so yeah. amazing yeah <laughs> part of me wants to go okay so what's on the cards <laughs> now because it's like 2019 and I'm, you did the coast to coast again uh right yes i did a tandem uh with a girl called anna mcnuff who's oh yes yeah who's actually currently running barefoot through britain yes uh, i've been seeing yeah. some of her videos yeah yeah she's crazy nuts great human yeah uh, what's next I'm not actually too sure something will come up yeah. uh, like it always tends to I don't really go searching for these things but the opportunity arises and so something will come up I'm sure I don't know what it is yet uh, but so no I said and I did say this year was really about exploring South Island what's on my doorstep and yes I've done some pretty cool stuff that instead of going on that trail which I've done 10 times go on that trail which I've never done before and yeah it's just a valley over but it's completely different well let's talk about a couple of those things then because I would love like you know <clears throat> I've just moved to the South Island um <laughs> and I love the exploring because it's this it's so totally different to the North Island so, and I'm a West Coast girl. I love the West Coast. And so moving to here has been such a contrast for me. Yeah. Um, but the mountains are just so beautiful. Uh, like, yeah, I, I, like unbelievably beautiful. But I miss the bush sometimes. I miss mm. getting into that lush, green, you know, um, yeah. sheltered <laughs> yeah. stuff that you get a little bit more of up in the North Island. But if there were like three places that you would either – have been to in the South Island, like, oh my God, you must go there and do that thing. Or that's on my list and I haven't done it yet. So what would three places be that come to mind when I say that in the South Island or even just New Zealand? Let's just go with New Zealand. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm going to say my favorite place in the entire world is Little Mount Peel. And that's because it's very close to home. And I grew up looking at it and it's the coolest, challenging, sort of an hour, an hour and a half up and then run down. I actually did that on the weekend. It was awesome. Um, that's the one thing that I do go back to because I just love it. Um, so I would highly recommend Little Mount Peel or just all around sort of that Mount Peel 
um, area. There's some really cool bush, right in the bush as well. Um, cool, yeah. noted. Little and Mount Peel. views are just freaking epic. Like yeah. you just look back over behind you into the Fairley or Tekapo area. You've got all the Southern Alps, Mount Hart, and you see the Port Hills and, ah, uh, yeah. I love it. <laughs> I was just making my heart so happy hearing all of that. I'm just like, yes, yes, going. It's on the list. Yeah. <laughs> um, the other one that's on my list that I haven't done is the Root Burn Track. And I really just want to run it one day. But logistics have probably been the reason why I haven't done it yet. Just yep. kind of heading up Glenorchy and then having, you know, vehicle at Tiana. It's not quite the easiest, uh, easiest commute in a day. But uh, yep. we'll figure that one out. That's, that's that is on. beautiful. Yeah, I've done that run one? it. I've walked it. We did the three day walk, and it was uh, just stunning. Yeah. So yeah, really beautiful. And that was my first great walk that I ever did. Ah, yeah. Um, cool. In New Zealand, and I was like really fortunate to. It was like a very last minute thing that a friend couldn't fly uh, to Queenstown. She's like, I'll take. I was like, I'll take your ticket. And she's like, So do you want to do the reap burn as well? And I was like, Uh. I don't really yeah. hike, but sure. <laughs> and like literally it was like four days. I was like in Auckland to walking the root burn. Oh. And it was like, it was like such an adventure. It was so phenomenal. It was it's my first ever overnight. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. I was like, I could have said no to doing the yeah. root burn and just gone, well, I know Queenstown. I've got friends there. I can mountain bike to my heart's content because yeah. – doing the walk was like way outside of my thing. And anyone who does hiking will hear me. I go, I did it in running shoes because I didn't have time to get any boots. So like yeah. I turned up to the first hut and like everyone's putting their shoes by the fire to dry them. <laughs> brown boots, brown boots, brown boots, <laughs> pink and purple <laughs> running shoes. I was just like, okay. Well, I'm always right. one of those girls. <laughs> but it was awesome. So I wouldn't uh, recommend doing it in running shoes, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> awesome. You will love it, especially if you run it in a day. So Yeah. No, All right. Do. <laughs> one other place that you either want to do in New Zealand or you've done and you would go, you've got to do this. You've got to put this on the list. Can I have one of both? Can I have yes, yes, one that you I can. haven't done? The Another one, one you haven't done. done. I want to do mountain bike with the old ghost road have you done that <sighs> yes oh, oh that place that place that place when we stopped at the first uh, at oh. the old ghost lake hut it was yeah. like someone turned on this you know the sun setting over the mountains and you're looking out through the valleys and it's like someone switched on a smoke machine and the you know the oh, mist is just like yeah. rolling through the hills that was yep. just spectacular, absolutely spectacular. Oh, and yeah. then when you ride down to the lake and then you look back as to where the hut is pitched, you're like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so it will not disappoint. Like have lots of battery in your phone, lots of stuff yeah. in your camera. It is, yeah, yep. we did it in two days. So, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. And um, there's plenty of people that do the big enduro and do it in a day. But I think yeah. if you want to enjoy a part of it, two days, <laughs> yeah. yeah, two days yeah. stay at Old Ghost Lake Hut for sure. Ah, uh, cool. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's definitely on the list. And the other one that I did do that I absolutely loved was the Humbridge Trail, or the Humbridge wow. Trail, which has just been made uh, the next great walk down in Tuatapari, the very bottom of the South Island. Yeah. It's beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful. What yeah. makes that like, like of the two that you've done, like Mount Peel and that, like, what is it that like, is the thing, like, why go there? It, it was, it had uh, so much. So you walk day one is all through the bush. Really, really nice. And then you pop up way up the top and then you kind of traverse all the way down and you see you've got Stewart Island, you've got Fiordland, you're right at the bottom of the world pretty much you know you've got Antarctica is the next one down and um just so remote so stunning mm. three-day walk beautiful challenging like challenging enough that it's still a good you know good adventure um and yeah just just pretty special place we had, epic, we, we had epic weather as well, which <laughs> always, always helps um, with the views. But yeah, no, yeah, yeah, definitely That's, recommend that one. 
Oh, it's so amazing how some of those places you can just really capture your, like capture your heart and just be like, that place that place I could go back and experience yeah. that time all over again like I'm always too scared to go back because I know the weather probably like we just had weather that was outstanding and I just yeah. I'm too scared to go back in case it's not <laughs> <laughs> I took about the dusky sound like that like the dusky sound is so beautiful oh. if you ever get the chance to go there because it's yeah. so much more remote than anywhere else like we were on a boat for that trip and Stewart Island is, was phenomenal, yeah. like doing the yeah. um, Rocky Road through there. That was amazing. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, it's just, you could just adventure forever. I know. There's like oh. not enough weekends. <laughs> <laughs> this is I know. And now that we've yeah. had this conversation, I'm like, all I want to do is go out. And I was like, today I actually planned to get on my bike after our conversation because I was like, uh. I know I'm going to get off this call and be like, I must get outside. <laughs> yeah. 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 A stunning day. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you so much for just sharing all your insights and your stories and all of that sort of stuff. Cause I know that there'll be women that have watched uh, that have watched this and they're at the end and they're just like, man, if she can do that stuff and that, cause they'll be feeling that niggle, they'll, they'll be fully inspired to go, all right, yeah. I'm going out. I'm going to do this thing, whatever it is. Cause it doesn't have to be a coast to coast, right? That that's no. going to be the thing that's going to like, make you stretch yourself for some people it might be just doing like a 5k run or a walk yeah. or something like that right it's definitely yeah so if you've yeah. got one one message that you, uh what's one message that you'd have for women who want to have more fun and adventure in their lives but they're afraid of taking that step oh don't overthink stuff i think as females well probably not specifically females but we tend to um we tend to think we are less capable of what we actually are and if just get some friends together and just go and do it and you'll be you'll get there and you'll be like well that wasn't actually as hard as what I thought it was like I do that all the time in my stuff even you know now I'm just like oh I don't know if I'm good enough I don't know if I can do that probably like a bit of the imposter syndrome and but just go and do it there's only one way to find out and you'll be so surprised and if you don't end up doing it, you'll learn something epic along the way. So, yeah, just take the first step. Awesome. That is perfect to finish this off on. So, Holly, if people want to um, get in touch with you either, because uh, I know you also do um, speaking as well. So you're speaking, yes. um, we'll be speaking together, actually, at the Spirited Women's Adventure yes. Race uh, for yeah. the first South Island one. So yeah, Holly's going to be cool. the guest speaker there. So that's going to be amazing. Uh, and cool. um I'll be emceeing it again, so we'll get to hang out uh, in person. Oh, yay. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. And um, if they want to get in touch with you about speaking or uh, with your charity, what's the best way that people can get in touch with you? Yeah, I've got a blog, which is a website, Holly Woodhouse, H-O-L-L-I-E, woodhouse.com. Uh, and then the same again on Instagram at Holly Woodhouse or on Facebook, you can find me, uh, The Adventurous Kiwi that name yeah. and what about the charities that you work alongside how can yeah and so out? yeah the charity uh is called four rangers so f-o-r rangers.com and then just four rangers on our instagram handle perfect i'll make sure we put a link uh with yeah. this video so that people can just jump through and yeah. show some support that way and of course if you, any of you ladies want to have this phenomenal uh <laughs> woman come and speak then uh, you can get in touch <laughs> yeah, with her that way so details, yeah <laughs> awesome thanks holly so much for taking the time out to hang out with us so uh now that uh we've connected we might actually be able to go out for an adventure together. i know go road gaining <laughs> yeah oh my goodness <laughs> <laughs> absolutely that'd be great well thanks for inviting me to come and speak it's, yeah i loved it my pleasure thanks holly no worries thank you bye Bye.